What is going on, church? My, have the tables have turned. I finally get to see you guys now. You see me on the news just about every week, and I long to be here seeing you guys. If you guys do not know who I am, my name is Cedric, and I have the privilege and honor, and it truly is a highlight of my life, to lead our creative team in doing what we love to do, and that's creatively move people towards Jesus. That's just how we function in our gift. And on behalf of the staff and the team here at Coastline, I really want to say thank you guys for being here. Listen, we look forward to this. If you guys don't know what church staff do, outside of Saturday, Sunday, as we spend Monday through Friday planning to do this again because we really love spending time with you guys. We really love seeing you guys and doing life with you guys. So thank you for joining us here if you're live in these seats or if you're in a cafe or joining us online. Thank you for being a part of the family. As you've heard from our lead pastor who's at his home, he's resting, guys. He had a hernia surgery on Tuesday and if you guys don't know what a hernia surgery is, it's where they first, they start by taking, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just messing, I'm not going to do that, because that would be, listen, I, listen, man, I was there when my son was born, and it was a cesarean, and I literally turned pale, if you can imagine it, I turned pale, they escorted me out of the room, so I'm definitely not going to explain a hernia surgery to you guys today, but if you guys would, just keep our pastor in prayer. I think what's killing him the most is that he can't be here, that he can't be playing with his children. If you guys know him, you know that he is type A. He's a hard charger. I mean, what should have been a two-week trip in Israel was a five-day trip for us, him and I, and we did all 14 days worth of stuff in five days. So that's just how he rolls. So keep him in your prayers that he can recover quickly so he can get back to doing what he loved doing. And that's just really doing life with you guys like us here. So this weekend. We have something special for you guys. We've never done it as a church, um, but we are really excited, and we've had the opportunity now to do it three times, and it's been fantastic every single time. These speakers have killed it, but I want to explain it to you guys a little bit more. What we're calling it is a six on six, right? So we have six beautiful, amazing speakers up here, and they've been challenged to bring a word, bring a message, share some truths and revelations of God's love, mercy, grace in their lives, but here's the caveat, guys. We, you guys don't want to be here for like three, four hours, right? Well, maybe you do. Maybe you do. I would be here for three, four hours. I work here. I love it. So if you want to stay that long, that's cool with me. But that's not how it's going to work today. So they only have six minutes to share. I mean, we, sometimes we take six minutes just to get out of bed. And they're going to give us a whole message in six minutes. It's going to be tight. And we're going to do this sort of game show fashion. I want you guys to be involved. So I've asked the team to put a six minute timer on that screen, that screen, and that screen in the back. So we're gonna get to see the clock count down just like the speakers and we get to a minute, 30 seconds. Are they gonna finish? Are they gonna finish? Oh my God, they don't look like they're closing this. They're not gonna make it to my, you know, we're gonna get to be a part of this. So I'm really stoked about that. But to save them a little time, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna intro them with their names really quickly. But when I do, I want you guys to understand these, this is, this is church family here. They come here every weekend just like you guys do, and they love this place, and they call this place home. So I want you guys to give them the type of applause you would give somebody from your family who just came home, the family reunion. I want you guys to show them the love. So when I call their names, I want you guys to spend a moment applauding them, cheering them on, encouraging them, because this is some of their first time speaking on a platform like this. So tonight we're going to kick off, or this morning, we're going to kick off this engagement with Shay Moore. Come on, guys. Yeah, yeah. Shay Moore is going to pass the microphone to Mr. John Litz. John Litz will then pass off his microphone to Miss Brandy Smith. Yes, yes, yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Brandy Smith will then hand off the hot mic to Mr. Ken Miller. Come on, come on. Yes. It's going to be great, right? Mr. Ken Miller will then hand off the microphone to Ms. Kat Kennedy. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then Ms. Kat Kennedy will hand it off to Mr. Josh McCaskill. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing. This team is awesome. They've been crushing it all morning. So we're going to, hey, hey, Shay, are you ready? So ready. You guys ready? Yeah. Hey, Dave, put the clock on. Good morning. I'm Shay Moore, and I am a type A control freak. 
organized, ambitious, has a plan for everything, it's nice to meet you. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. Solid advice, God, but I have a plan. Before marrying my husband, Jeremy, I was engaged to another man, and from the outside, it looked great. But I was living in my own personal hell. The emotional abuse and the manip manipulation was constant, and I allowed myself to believe that I deserved it. I would feel in my heart like God was telling me that this wasn't his plan, that there was more for me, but then, as so many do, I would convince myself it was just in my head, and I would stay. It wasn't until the abuse turned physical that I found the courage to walk away. And a few months later, God brought Jeremy into my life. We were both planners, career-driven perfectionists with hearts for the Lord. Plus, he's smoking hot, so that didn't hurt. <laughs> and when I say planners, I mean planners. Before we were even engaged, we had our kids' names picked out. Not just their names, but the order in which they would be born. <laughs> in 2014, oh, and it was girl, boy, girl. In 2014, our daughter Amelia was born, and less than two years later, we were expecting our son, plan coming right along. But at 20 weeks, we found out that there was complications with our son that put him at a high risk to be stillborn. Nothing has ever brought us to our knees as fast as that information did, and we relied on God more than ever during that season. But again, God prevailed, and our son Huntley was born tiny but healthy. Our plan was coming right along. When Huntley was one and a half, we began the next baby discussion. Do we, don't we? What do we want? And during fall of 2018, while we were in freedom, during opening song of worship, God spoke to me and told me that he had a plan for this child, that this child was going to do something great. See, God is the God of relationships. It is his nature to speak. But your desire to hear him has to overwhelm your desire to be in control. A few weeks later, we were pregnant. A few months into the pregnancy, I asked God for a boy's name, you know, just in case. And God replied, Hebrew for strength. A quick Google search turned up Jewish script, you know, those tiny pictures that I can't read. And I quickly moved on. I had two toddlers needing me. And it wasn't until later that night that I was telling my husband the story that Jeremy replied, Gabriel, God is my strength. To which I emphatically replied, oh, no, I don't like that name. That's not going to happen. <laughs> to which God immediately said to me, He's not yours, he's mine. So on July 4th, our baby who God created during freedom was born on the day of freedom. And as my husband held Gabriel, Isaiah Moore, for the first time, the earth shook with a 6.4 magnitude earthquake. You can't make this stuff up. God's plan is so much better than ours. <laughs> Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus begins to predict his death. And Peter is so upset that he cries out, this shall never happen. We can look into Peter's words. He's saying, this is not my plan. You can't leave us. To which Jesus replies, get behind me, Satan. Jesus' rebuke of Peter is stern, comparing Peter's plan to Satan, perverting God's path of salvation. Think for a moment. If Peter's plan would have come true rather than God, Jesus would have never gone to the cross for us. We would not be justified by faith. There would be no righteousness. We would still be living under the law. God's plan is so much better. Many of the wise sayings in Proverbs identify that, yes, it is good to have a plan. But we must recognize that though that plan seems right to us, it may not be the best thing for us. The good news is that Jesus is in the business of changing our plans to his, resulting in something far better than we could ever hope for. Look at Saul of Tarsus. Saul was on a bloody mission of savagery against the Church of Christ. But God had a plan for his life. And when Saul turned away from doing what he thought was right to obey the will of God, he began preaching Jesus is the Messiah with a passion that changed history. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Following Jesus requires a change in plans. We have to give up doing what we think is right and what we want through constantly submitting to him. While our salvation is secure in Jesus, the struggle to make him Lord of our lives requires a constant dying of self to follow God's will. So when God changes your plans, look for his blessing as something new and unexpected and allow God's grace to carry you into his next steps for your life. 
When the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding, it is because your heart is deceitful. You don't understand the overall big picture, but God does. God never lies. God never changes. So trust him. So if there's any other fellow control freaks out there, I encourage you, say the prayer. Say, God, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And allow him to start working a miracle in your life. Thank you, Shay. And when I found out I was in chair two, I had no idea what Shay was going to speak on, but this ends up being like part B of God's plan, just, just the Lord's, the way he works things out. I'd like to invite you this morning to do a little mental exercise with me real quickly, and just to think of uh, some piece of art in your mind, uh, a painting, if you will, uh, something that maybe is hanging in your house or you've seen in an art museum, something that connects with you maybe. And I want you to in your mind's eye as you're looking at that painting, just to kind of fade everything out except for just a small little area, maybe off center, off to the side somewhere. And whatever brush strokes you see, whatever things you might uh, you know, be able to see just from that small little peephole view, just know that if that was all you saw, you would have no idea what the rest of that painting would be like, correct? If that painting represents your life, a lot of times, in fact, always, we only see about that much. And from that much of a view, you can't tell whether this is a masterpiece, right, or whether it's just a sidewalk special. You can't tell whether it's worth a million dollars or not worth your time it could be anything because all we're seeing is this. And when we live our lives, we faintly see what we've already been through. We have no idea what the master is painting on the rest. We're living right here and we see this very clearly. And this day is much more important to us than yesterday. We live in this time period. And you know what? That's how God designed it and that's actually how God wants it. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, we're not supposed to, stress about tomorrow. We're not supposed to stress about next week or next year. We have enough stress just for today where it's really clear without worrying what the next day and the next month and the next season of life will be. And so as we think about that this morning, um, it's tough for some of us to trust in God as to what the rest of that picture will look like. Some of us may be in here this morning and we may be saying, you know what, um, I, I hear what you're saying to trust God, but uh, finances aren't where they need to be right now. Uh, health isn't where it needs to be right now. Um, relationships in my life are broken right now, and I'm having a very hard time trusting in what's going to happen when I'm living in this moment, and I see this moment very clearly. Psalm 23 has some amazing words on this, and it's a psalm that probably most of you have memorized or have heard enough times where you probably could recite it even if you don't think you could. The Lord is my shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall want nothing because he's my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. These are the good times, right? This, this is the good stuff right there where you can just lay back in the grass and say, look at the blue sky and say, good, good father, Lord, thank you for this day. And then the psalmist does something really interesting because he kind of takes this left turn and all of a sudden you find yourself somewhere totally different. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you're like, uh, can, can we go back like one, one verse? I like that over there, not the valley of the shadow of death. And let me tell you, sometimes we find ourselves in that. If you've never found yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, you know, praise the Lord. Many of us have found ourselves there several times and as we are venturing, and some of you may be there this morning, and as I find myself in the valley of the shadow of death, it's very difficult to take my eyes off of my surroundings and put them anywhere else but my troubles. Jesus knew what it was like to be in the valley of the shadow of death. Think about the night before he's crucified. Here he is. He knows what's coming. He knows about the spiritual, emotional, physical pain and toil of the cross. So the night before, he is brought to his knees under that stress of, the of what's coming up in that next 24 hours. And as he cries out to the Lord, the Father in heaven, he begins to sweat. 
drops of blood, the capillaries in his sweat glands had begun to burst under the pressure. And it doesn't just say little drops of blood, it says great drops of blood. Jesus Christ understands our needs. He understands our troubles. He's lived through it. And let me tell you, he's, his valley of the shadow of death is much more low and dark than anything we're going to uh, encounter in our life. Uh, and yet Jesus stayed focused. Where's the psalmist's vision if we go back to Psalm 23? He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's not my ways. It's not what I bring to the table. How many times, I mean, I do this all the time. I'm standing in this little area of my life, this little area of the, the painting of my life. And I am totally like focused on my troubles, where I've been, the little rustle in the bush. Is that a snake or what's going to come out? Is a raccoon going to attack me? I don't know, but I am stuck in here. And the psalmist says, no, I put my eyes on Jesus. I look to his rod and his staff. He is the defender. He's the one who's going to lead me through this. You know, so many times in the world, they want to turn to palm readers and fortune tellers to tell them what's going to happen next. I can't, I can't live in this. I need to know what's going to happen. And Jesus says, I don't want you to know what's going to happen. I want you to trust me. Take your hand, put it in my hand. I'm going to lead the way. And you just look at me. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You know, Jesus is working on something in your life and my life, and it's a masterpiece. And when that picture is finished and we look at it, it's not us in the middle of that frame. It's the cross. Amen. Praise the Lord. Psalm 118, 17. I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. This verse became very real to me about three years ago. I meditated on it day and night. You see, sometimes the Lord, he heals immediately, but sometimes it's slow. The Lord, I don't believe, ever causes illness, but I do believe that he will use it for his purpose, and his purpose is always good if we let him. In July 2016, I had the perfect storm for an autoimmune condition. My beloved father had just died of pancreatic cancer, and I got a concussion and a chest cold in the same week. My husband and son got the same chest cold, but they recovered within a few days. However, for me, within 24 hours, I went from living an active lifestyle to not being able to walk up the stairs in my own home. If I had to stand long enough to take a shower, it felt like I was running a marathon. At first I thought I must have pneumonia because it came on so quickly. I went to urgent care and they said, no, you look great, all your vitals are fine, go home. Um, but I knew something was wrong, obviously I can't walk up my stairs. So I started to see, um, I had a journey then of about 13 different doctors I saw, from cardiologists to rheumatoid arthritis, or rheumatologist to um, incrinologist, all of them saying that your blood work looks fine, nothing's wrong with you, um, but there was obviously something wrong. If I stood for any length of time, my muscles would get so weak, I felt like I was going to pass out. A month later, I was diagno diagnosed with POTS, posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, and what POTS is, is that basically, is that your blood pulls at your feet, and it doesn't go to your head. This combined with uh, hypothyroidism, which I already had, which is an autoimmune, created a full-blown autoimmune in my body. An autoimmune disease is when your, your immune system attacks your own cells because it thinks it's a threat to your body. For the next six months, I was instructed to take 8 to 10 grams of salt a day because that would increase my blood volume. And this helped. It did get me back to a functional lifestyle, but not a normal lifestyle. For the next year and a half, I had lightheadedness, chronic fatigue, faintness, heart palpitations. My blood pressure would go dramatically up and down and had extreme muscle pain and fatigue. I cried out to our Lord to heal me because I know he is a Lord who heals and I prayed that he would heal me. And I didn't think that he healed me because it wasn't immediate. And this was hard for me. I wondered why he wouldn't heal me immediately because I knew that he could. And this was a deciding moment for me. Would I trust that he would use this pain for greater good even when I didn't understand why I had to be the one to go through it? I decided yes, I would trust in God. And my, Lord, my prayer changed from, Lord, heal me, 
to Lord, heal me the moment this is done for kingdom purpose, the moment that you are done with it. But do heal me. I still want the healing. Um, but do heal me the moment you are done and give me joy in the process. You see, I had a one-year-old son and I didn't want him to remember his mom being anything but fun and joyful because um, I didn't know many, how many days I had with him and I wanted them all to be good. The Lord spoke to my heart that he would heal me through worship. That two-year battle was tough. I was in the ER multiple times. I still didn't know if I would ever be healed completely. And that was the hardest part. It was fear. I had so much fear that I would not get to be the one who got to raise my son. I would not get to see him play baseball. I would not be the one to get to talk to him about God and how good he is and never to blame him because it wasn't his fault that his mom left early. And I feared not growing old with the love of my life. But there was also a sweet richness. I grew more spiritually in those two years than I grew in the last 38 years of my life. Praise God. Praise God. That is right. I knew he had me, and he also gave me joy. Every day I had gratitude and joy as I went through that season. During those two years, I researched worship because I mentioned early on the Lord had spoken to my heart. He would heal me through worship. And he showed me four distinct but intertwined areas. The first is the body. The God had created the body for healing and that it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I was to be a wise steward of what I put into my body. I was to put into nutrition, and I was to take out those foods that were inflammatory. I was to work out because the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. See, I learned a lot about the body. Um, the other was the mind, and that was the battlefield. I had to remove all doubt that the Lord would not heal me. I had to remove all doubt that he was not for me. I had to remove all doubt that he did not love me enough. And the battlefield was my mind, and scripture was my weapon. And um, I found that for me, as I spoke the word out loud, it became even more powerful. Romans 12.2 was a verse that I held on to. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The third was community. Um, before I got sick, I didn't think I needed a group. <laughs> um, getting sick changes your mind on a lot of things. And I joined Freedom, which was one of the best decisions I ever made. The Lord healed my soul before he healed my body. It helped me let go of some unforgiveness. And I had sweet freedom that I had never experienced before. The last is Grace. Because although I could come into agreement with God in all these different areas, it's by his grace alone that he does the healing. So um, three years after my journey began, I stand before you today virtually symptom-free. Yeah. I still have a few things. I'm still in process, like food allergies. Polar, uh, can't fly because of altitude. But I know the Lord is not done. And I wouldn't ask for those dark days again, but I will also tell you that I would not take them away because of the sweetness I have in my relationship with our Savior today is greater than the cost of getting here. Amen. Well, good morning, you guys. You can see my, my little notes are getting a little bit wrinkled. <laughs> um. This morning, I just want to, uh, to, to just speak on something that God had uh, worked in, in my life. Um, uh, it took a little while for him to get it through, uh, but it finally sunk in. But um, I want to, first of all, title this sermon, even though it's only six minutes long, it should have a title. It makes it seem more important, I think. Uh, so the title of this sermon is going to be uh, Stupid Dumb Dave. Stupid Dumb Dave. <laughs> It's not referring to any Davids here, uh, but uh, rather to my cousin David, uh, my dad's twin brother, uh, pretty crazy when they were young. They looked really a lot alike. Uh, but they had, they had uh, Bob and his wife had uh, three boys, David, Jamie, and Jeffrey. Uh, David was the uh, techie guy, computer guy, does on where, uh, online you know, coding and that type of thing. Uh, Jamie uh, was the, or is the talkative, everybody's friend, uh, you know, hugs everybody, what up cuz, you know, that type of thing. And uh, then Jeffrey was really a good combination of the two. But David had developed this ability, uh, really an art form of ignoring Jamie. And Jamie, being the talker, just hated it. And I remember so many times Jamie would be trying to get a hold of David's uh, attention and David wouldn't say nothing. He's just working on his computer. Do it again and nothing. 
And finally, I get so frustrated, Jamie just goes, stupid dumb Dave, or stupid dumb dummy, you know, stupid and dumbs just flying everywhere. And, uh, but needless to say, David had, had developed this art of ignoring um, his brother. And I want to kind of use that in as an example of what God had done in me probably when I was about uh, 14 to uh, early 20s, I struggled in the area of fear uh, to the point uh, where I was starting to have trouble uh, with my stomach uh, because of, uh, you know, stomach acid and that type of thing. Uh, but it was really two areas that I struggled with, and that was, uh, and I, I know a lot of people can probably relate to this because I've heard stories, but uh, that I wasn't saved. And not that I had gotten saved and lost my salvation, but simply I hadn't done it right. Uh, you know, I hadn't raised my hand in church and gone down to the altar and, and did the whole thing. Um, but so I struggled in this area. And then the other area, and I noticed it was a pattern uh, in my life, was uh, the fear of uh, getting a disease uh, and dying to the point uh, towards the end uh, where I was really a germaphobe, uh, was taking my own silverware to restaurants, you know, that type of thing. Um, and it wasn't until the Lord really got through that haze of fear, and anybody that's dealt with uh, fear before knows how dark that can be, but I got through and he gave me two things, and one of them was that he, he spoke to me and just said, you know, Ken, you need to learn to trust me. Uh, the plan of salvation was, was my idea, was my plan. Uh, I designed it, and it's my responsibility. You have nothing to do with it. You just have to accept it. Um, and then he also uh, just gave me, uh, re- relative to uh, my health, just saying, you know, I made you, I created you, uh, I can take care of you. Uh, and then he gave me the scripture that I want to share. You guys will all recognize it. Um, we demolish in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, we demolish arguments in every uh, pretension uh, or claim that sets itself above and against the knowledge of God, and we take it captive, uh, every thought, and make it obedient to Christ. And really what the, the Lord had encouraged me to do and the way to apply this uh, was when those thoughts came in that, that I would ignore them, just like my cousin Dave did to Jamie that I wouldn't try to sit there and logically stamp it out. You know, I'm a thinker. Uh, I want to, you know, figure this out, and I'm going to be okay here. And then, but it was a pattern uh, of being, being afraid that I wasn't saved and then being afraid that, uh, that I would get sick. And if there's a pattern, you recognize the pattern, you know there's an agenda, right? And so I started basically the way I would do this is when those thoughts would come in, I would physically or verbally uh, just say, no, I am not going to waste my time. Uh, and up to that point, I'd wasted so much time just being stuck and stagnant in that fear. I mean, you're talking a good percent of my, my thought life. It, it was crazy. Um, but as I started putting that into practice, uh, I started seeing freedom. Uh, and it was, it was a little bit slow, uh, but, you know, these type of things, when you're dealing with fear, um, it's a, it's a battle. And it was mentioned earlier about the battle of the mind. And I don't know where you guys are at this morning. If you guys struggle with fear, probably most of us do. Um, but I want to just encourage you to grab onto these truths, uh, of really trusting God and then, uh, learning the art, really the art form of ignoring the enemy just turning him off. You can't logically think through a spiritual battle. Um, if you come to a spiritual battle of fear, uh, with logic, you'll lose every time. You know, uh, fear doesn't play within the parameters of logic. It goes way, way beyond that. Uh, what we have to do is we have to fight it with the word. Uh, scriptures like, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and then what? A sound mind. And that's God's, you know, that's God's agenda for us is to, to be able to walk in freedom, uh, to be able to walk in um, health of our mind and soundness of our mind. And I believe if we put these things into play, if we had the opportunity for the Lord to open our ears to the spiritual world, uh, we'd be hearing on the other side of the battle line, stupid dumb Dave, he doesn't listen to me. Stupid Sharon, I'm feeding lies about her marriage, but she ain't taking it, you know. Um, God's plan for us is freedom and uh, to be able to open us up to hear his voice instead of the enemies. So I just want to encourage you guys in that this morning.
Well, hello, my name is Kat, and I grow up, grew up in a pretty broken household. I grew up with a diagnosed sociopath as a father, and I wish I had time to tell you that whole story today, but that clock just keeps ticking down. But because of the things that he said to me and the things that he spoke over me, I had a distorted view of myself and a distorted view of the world, and my self-confidence plummeted, and my self-image was tainted. And so I desired to be skinnier, and I went to great lengths to make that happen. I desired to be prettier, and I desired to be wanted. And because of the things that I saw on social media, the songs that I listened to that said, who says you're not perfect, it threw me in even deeper. Because I said, I know who says I'm not perfect. So watch me become physically perfect in the world's eyes. Now, I don't want to confuse you, because today I'm not talking about your physical appearance, because y'all are a lovely bunch in here. But I'm talking about your outlook to the world your behaviors, and your outlook to yourself. Because the things that we listen to, the things that we see on social media, the things that people tell us influence the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see the world. It influences what we think is valuable, and it influences where we think fun is to be had in varying degrees. And if we take these songs or these sayings such as you are perfect, or you do you, or anyone who tells you you need to change is a hater, and we apply that to our lives, and how we see ourselves, and how we see the world, we are gonna forfeit everything God says, the, the Bible says God wants to do in our lives. Because we're not perfect. But there is one who is perfect. And so the lie is that you're perfect, and the truth is you're broken. And so the reason I'm hitting so hard on this is because it's not hard to believe. It's not like these songs are saying, hey, tomorrow you're gonna wake up and be a dinosaur. Or the next day, maybe a butterfly. Because that would be absurd. But it's taking this idea of perfection, something that we think we understand, and saying it's tangible. And that's what Satan does. He takes the truth, and he twists it, and makes you want it. And so if you take that idea that you don't need to change, but everyone else needs to change around you, you are going to fail to grow in any way. And so to find healing and to find growth, you need to say, hey, I'm not perfect, and acknowledge that but say, I also can't be the solution to it, but I know the one who is. But if you want to be perfect, the whole Old Testament has a bunch of laws in it. And you can try and follow those, but we read what happened. It didn't work out very well. So that's why we have Jesus. And he says, I know you're broken. Come to me, and I will help you. And the second lie that we often hear is that you don't need to change. You need to change. The whole message in the Bible, the message from God is, I love you so much, I'm going to change you. Because he knows that your freedom, he knows that all your potential lies behind you looking more like Jesus. And because God loves you so much, he's going to start to transform you to look like him. Because he loves you too much to leave you in the place you are right now. That place of anxiety of depression, of a twisted self-image, of worry or doubt. He loves you too much to leave you in that place. I, I've been reading a lot about how gold is refined in the Bible. And I also learned that a goldsmith and a metalsmith are different things, so now you know too. So a goldsmith takes gold and he heats it above intense heat, above fire until it boils and all the imperfections raise to the surface. And then he wipes away those imperfections. And he continues to do this over and over and over again until he can see his reflection in that gold. And that's what Jesus is going to do to you too. He's going to bring those imperfections to the surface and wipe them away so he can see his reflection in you. Amen. So there's three things that I have learned that I, that I learned to help me change to look more like Jesus and to help me understand that I am broken but there is healing. And the first is you need to be living in the word. And there's a huge difference between coming to church here on Sunday and listening to a message. That's good. Keep doing that. But that's hearing the word. And then going home and having your quiet time and doing devotions. That's you reading the word. Also a good thing. Keep doing that. But living in the word is different. Take it this way. I can go to a mirror and say, ooh, got some spinach in my teeth. But that mirror's not going to do anything about it. That's like you coming to church or reading the Bible and hearing something amazing, like go love people. You say, wow, that's awesome, but not doing anything about it. It's like me going back to the mirror and be like, why do I still have spinach in my teeth? 
Second, you need to be in community with people who love Jesus. People who can encourage you and uplift you and help you find that freedom. Who can be there when things happen that are hard. Who can remind you that you're not perfect, but there's someone who is. It's a connect table out there. Find your community. Third, you need to be in constant dependence on the Holy Spirit and in communication with him. Pastor Ann just did this amazing series talking all about the Holy Spirit, talking about our dependence on him, talking about his love for each and every one of you in here and how to talk to him and to go to him and say, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to do next. I am broken, but you do. So those three things is you need to be living in the word. You need to find that community. You need to be in constant dependence on that Holy Spirit. Well, good morning, church. Hey, so I, uh, I was thinking and praying this whole, this whole week leading up to this, what, God, what do you want me to speak about? And this question kept coming into my mind. It said, tell them about Jesus and tell them that I love them. And this, and this question that was in my mind was, why do they need to kill Jesus? Because here's this guy going around and he's preaching the good news and he's saying, you know, love one another, take care of one another. And he's healing the sick and he's healing the lame. Why would you want to get rid of a guy like that? And so the title of of my message to, to play off of Ken is The Scandal of Grace. So Luke chapter 15 demonstrates this, this beautiful parable that Jesus gives as he's talking to a to a group of people. And the two groups of people I'll I'll address in a second, but we know the parable. A younger son tells his father, essentially, you're dead to me. So the inheritance that's split between my brother and I, give me my half now. And I'm going to go live my best life because I can do it better on my own. And he ends up feeding pigs somewhere out there during the middle of a famine after he's spent all of his money. He's got nothing left, and there's a giant famine in the land. In verse 17 it says, literally, it says, when he came to his senses, right? So he wakes up and he's like, what am I doing with my life? I've hit rock bottom and, there, and I'm going to die out here. Maybe I can go back to my father. But the problem is I've disowned him. I've given up my sonship. And so how, how can I make this work? And he, and he realizes I can become a slave. Because even as a slave to my father, at least I've got somewhere to sleep and something to eat. So he sets out to go and to, to reconcile with his father. And he's got this speech in his mind. Oh, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he's convinced that this is what's going to get him back into the house of his father, even as a slave. Now, the people that Jesus are speaking to, or that Jesus is speaking to, there's two, two types. You've got the sinner class, which is the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the, uh, the diseased, the ill these are the, the people that, that really kind of comprise most of the society. And then you've got Pharisees and scribes, this other class of people, so to speak, right? And between the two, I mean, we got church, right? So Jesus is speaking to these people, and, and I'm wondering what's going on in their minds. Because to the first group, they're thinking, okay, this is me. What's my penance? What is it going to cost for me to get back into the grace of the Father? Am I going to be a slave for the rest of my life? Because I'm not as educated as the Pharisees. I don't have the kind of money that they do. This is, this is the way, they're waiting for the hammer to drop. And then the Pharisees, the other guys, right, they're rubbing their hands. They're like, oh, yeah, get him. How dare he disown his father? He's going to have to grovel. He's going to be a slave. Stick it to him, Jesus. Let's hear it. Preach it on, right? And here's where the scandal comes in, because in verse 20, Jesus completely upends everything they thought grace was supposed to be. Because they had always thought grace was was cheap, that you could buy it with tears, you could buy it with good works. You could count the number of steps on the Sabbath to make sure that you didn't actually work. But, But we all know grace is not cheap. It costs Jesus everything. In verse 20, it says that while he was still a long ways off, the father sees his son And filled with compassion, begins to run to him. He falls upon his neck, embraces his son, and he kisses him. He says, my son, you have returned home. And in that moment, their eyes were opened as to what what was being told to them, completely different than everything they had been taught. Now, the older brother, right, 
as, as he's hearing all this, or I'm sorry, he's not hearing it, but he's out there doing the field work, the father didn't even acknowledge the younger son's speech. Oh, father, I have sinned against you. He says, it doesn't matter. God does not allow restitution for your sin because it's already been paid for. He doesn't matter to the father why you left or how long you've been gone or why, uh, what you've been doing while you were gone. What matters is that you come back. And so he says, bring me some steak, get the music going, give me a cloak. We're going to have a party for my son because he's come back. And the son hears the music going on inside the house. And he figures out that the, the younger son is being celebrated, that he's come back, and he gets mad. And I know that if I was in his shoes, I'd be pretty upset too. I'd be like, what, what, are you kidding me? First of all, that's my steak that he's eating, right? Because he already, that's my cloak. And he gets upset because he says, I, I've been obedient to you this whole time. I never left. I worked really, really hard for you. And you're going to celebrate him coming back after what he did to you? And the father, how does he respond to the older brother? Because the father could have easily been like, fine, you know, wallow in your self-pity, right? But he doesn't. It says he goes out to his older son and he pleads with him. says, come back inside. Join this party. And he listens to the older brother talk about how upset he is. And this is beautiful. He says, he says my son, you know that I love you. And all that I have is yours. But this brother of yours has returned home. He was lost and is now found. He was dead and is now alive. I like to think that as Jesus is telling the story to, to these two types of people, that the younger brother, these, uh, the sinners are, are listening to this, and, and God is, er, Jesus is telling them, God's grace is big enough for you. And then when he's talking about the older brother, that he's looking at, at the Pharisees, and he's saying, God's grace is big enough for you too. So I'm going to read this one part, because I, I, I don't want to mess this up, and I, I don't want to miss this opportunity. The scandal of grace, God's perfect grace that is Jesus, is this. Whoever you are in that crowd, tax collector, Pharisee, you can experience God's grace right here, right now. Be mesmerized by the life-changing fact that God delights in you and that he is madly in love with you. All it takes is an acknowledgement of the truth that you've just heard and the receipt of this perfect and free gift. For it is by this grace, and by this grace alone, that you are saved. Wow, amazing, amazing. You know, as a church, when we set out for our goals for this year, early in January, we just settled on that we were going to do two things. We are going to attempt to do two things the whole year. And that's take people deeper and love people better. And what we, what we quickly realized is that there's two things that we really have to understand fundamentally for that to even be a possibility for us even to begin to reach that goal. And that's to help people understand grace. So if you don't understand that grace is not something you can achieve in your own works, it's going to be a very difficult road for you. If you don't understand that you can't run fast enough, jump high enough, earn enough money, do enough good works to earn God's grace, it's going to be very difficult for you to live the life that God has called you to live. Secondly, we had to take a look at righteousness and what that really looked like as a believer. You see, every message really boils down to Jesus on the cross and what he did on the cross. And so we all have this fundamental understanding that on the cross, Jesus took my sins. He took the burdens of that into his body so much so that it crushed his heart and he made it no more. He made it where I can have a personal relationship with the living God. But the part that's lesser talked about is the other transaction where his righteousness, his complete righteousness was now made available to us. And we were clothed in his righteousness. That is the exchange that happened on the cross. And if we don't understand that righteousness is what is available to us fully, then we will also have a very difficult time trying to live this life. You see, the problem with righteousness is that church for a long time has, has made it to where it's like it's a self-righteous type of deal. 
This is really why a lot of us have stayed out of church for a long time because it was a bunch of people telling us that if I do Jesus plus something, Jesus plus X, Y, Z, then I will be righteous. Then God will hear my prayers. Then I will start to be healed. Then I will start to have influence. Then I will start to have this amazing relationship with God. If I do Jesus plus X, Y, Z. Well, that's contrary to scripture. See, scripture tells us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We were never designed to seek a self-righteousness for, our, for, for ourselves. We were designed to seek his righteousness. Because when we clothe ourselves with the righteousness of Jesus, then the Father can look down and see Jesus within us. So understanding grace and righteousness is, is key. If you're going to take people deeper, if you're going to attempt yourself to go deeper into your relationship with God, you have to understand grace and righteousness and what it looks like to live this in your life. So I want to invite you guys to close your eyes as we get ready to pray and close out this service. As we've heard, we've heard six speakers today share powerful truths of God's word. It's amazing what God can do in our lives if we give him the chance. But if you study the numbers in the Bible, you'll, you'll quickly realize that six happens to be this number of incompletion. It's, it's, not, it's something that's not whole. Whereas to seven represents a complete number. And at the end of the day, that's, what, that's what this is all about. God wants to make us whole. He wants us to be co healed completely, mentally, spiritually, and physically. And so I want to invite you guys to an opportunity to allow the seventh speaker, the Holy Spirit, to make himself known to you. Because the problem with just raising your hand and, and saying like, Jesus, I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's great. You should do it. But I think too many people are walking around with Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but not walking around with the Holy Spirit helper inside of them, helping them live out heaven on earth. We have to understand this is so crucial. God wants heaven on earth. So it's not about being saved and then trying to be saved long enough, long enough until I'm in my, in my elderly age and then I die. Oh, like, I just made it. No, he wants you to live heaven on earth right now. As a 15-year-old, as a 30-year-old, as a 60-year-old, and we all know no one goes beyond that. It stops at 60, right? But he wants you to live that right now. So as I get ready to pray, I want you guys to think about two things. If you have not made Jesus your Lord so that he can become your Savior, I want you to do that. But if you've been walking with Jesus for, for a long time, you've been, you, you've been living as a, as a Christian for a long time, but you have not yet opened yourself to the Holy Spirit because that's why we, we just did a whole four-week, five-week series on the Holy Spirit because a lot of people have not accepted the Holy Spirit because of what, what we think it means. When it's very clear. The Holy Spirit is our helper. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus is not here. He said, I must go away. And now he's with his father sitting at his right hand. But he says, I will send a helper. Someone that helps you live out these truths. Live in grace. Live in love every single day. And so if you never get to this place where you're always afraid of the Holy Spirit because you're thinking that it's, it's something that he came here to condemn you. The Bible says he came to help. So if you're really going to do this, then you need him. So on the count of three, if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior or accept the Holy Spirit into your life so you can start living out these, out these truths, I would invite you to do that. Three, two, one. Just slip your hands up so I can pray for you. Thank you. Yes. Jesus, Father, we thank you. We thank you for making grace and righteousness available to us fully. Not a single ounce of blood has to be shed ever again for us to receive the full measure of grace and righteousness that you've made available to us. So for everybody that's making that decision right now, today, Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit. We welcome you as Lord so that you can be our savior, so you can save us from this mess of, that, that, we, that we get ourselves into, that you can save us from this brokenness that we were born into so that you can save us from the condemnation of the world and of the enemy. We welcome you and we thank you. 
we thank you for making it available to us. And we ask that you give it to us right now in a full measure, Lord. A full measure of grace, righteousness, a full measure of your Holy Spirit. Because I love how the Bible always talks about the Holy Spirit coming upon somebody and strengthening them, refreshing them. I feel like there's people in here today that need to be refreshed. So refresh them, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Amen. We're going to close with a worship song. If you've made that decision today, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to close with a worship song. If you made that decision today, I highly encourage you to let somebody know. We're going to have our prayer leaders here as the song is playing. Just come up, tell them the decision you made. Let them connect you. Let them, let them pray to God on your behalf. We thank you guys for joining us today.